My little brother, the best way to put it was a ball of energy. Everywhere he went, he was always energetic, you know, on the move. It was real easy for him to make friends, so he had a lot of friends. Oh, I knew Dorian real well. He was my little, my little buddy. Adults and children alike, they just loved my brother. He had this aura about him that people just, I guess they were drawn to. He was real, like, savvy, I guess you could say. He was like a mental computer. You could tell him something, he'll remember it forever. He had attention to detail. Out of me and my siblings, me and him were closer, I guess because we were the stair-step babies and my brother was like a year older. My oldest brother, so he was more of an independent, headstrong, and me and my brother were like two peas in a pod. We were inseparable. It was crazy when everything happened because it affected a lot of people like it does still to this day. This is how people remember Dorian Thomas, the kid that everyone knew and loved, the funny kid who enjoyed riding his bike and fishing. Very street smart, very, you know, savvy kid. And it's just one of those things, you know, you, people think it's never gonna happen and it, it happened. He was a good kid. I'd watched him ride his bicycle. We lived one block apart drove past her every day and would see him out riding his bike. So the minute they said Dorian Thomas was missing, I'm thinking just a kid that didn't come home. He knew something and whomever is out there still that knows what he might have known something about. I hope God reveals you. I prayed since October 26 of 1998 that this family would have some kind of closure. Dorian Dion Thomas was nine years old when he was last seen in Amarillo, Texas on October 26, 1998. He was reported missing 24 hours later on October 27th. I was a freshman in college at the time. I remember the case being on every news channel. Driving to class, I'd pass billboards with Dorian's photo and the words, where is Dorian Thomas in big black letters. The case was on everyone's lips, no matter what age they were. Everyone in town was talking about his disappearance and everyone had an opinion on where Dorian was. My co-producer Madison was in fifth grade when Dorian went missing. I just remember thinking, you know, what if this was one of my friends that went missing? And I think that that was what hit home the most was the fact that he was a little boy in Amarillo um, and he could have been my friend and absolutely no one knew what happened to him. And that has stuck with me since 1998. I asked Madison if she was scared at the time that she might be abducted or if she felt like this was just an isolated incident. I don't know if the the thought of someone going around abducting children was honestly something that I've even thought about until you just said that because I just remember seeing his photo on the news or in the newspaper or on the billboards around Amarillo and just being so concerned for him, not even thinking that like, this could happen to me or one of my close friends. That never even crossed my mind, honestly. And I don't know if it's because I grew up in Southeast Amarillo and this happened over on the north side of Amarillo. I've honestly never even thought about that. Because they were close in age, the case stuck with Madison. Every year became a reminder that Dorian was still gone. 
in October of every year, I will tell my mom, like, mom, it's the eighth anniversary of when Dorian went missing. Or mom, it's the 10th, 12th, 15th, 20th, you know, we're this many years out. And every year there's just been something about this case has always stuck with me and has always been in my heart. And just every year it would come up and it was something that I would only talk to my mom about. Madison and I worked together at a community college and we realized most of our students and a lot of our coworkers don't even know about Dorian. The two of us thought this case was important to share with people who had never heard the story before. But also we have hopes of getting answers for his family, for the community, and for ourselves. We both agree that someone somewhere knows something. Dorian Thomas was last seen wearing a red shirt and blue jeans. Neither Dorian nor his most prized possession, his aqua blue bicycle, have ever been seen again. I personally put that bike together for him. He would go out in the neighborhood and come back with like just random bike parts. He was like, I want you to make me a bike. I was like, well, you don't have any tires, right? (laughs) So he goes to my grandma's house, who stays right around the corner on 10th and goes and steals my little cousin's bike out the backyard, which is a little girl's bike. And he was like, uh, can you put these tires on there? I was like, yeah. And so I put the tires on there. And so that's how he ended up, he called it his low rider. And he was so in love with that bike that he had to have it up and rolling. And so I Frankensteined it together for him and he couldn't have been happier. And that was like every day he get up, he get on that bike every day. That's Dorian's older brother, Brandon. He still lives in North Heights, which we'll talk more about later. He's a mobile mechanic, does carpentry work, and produces music on the side. The past few years have been rough for him. He was robbed, then had an accident which resulted in the loss of one of his fingers, and he fractured his femur, tore his ACL and PCL. He now has six screws in his knee and phantom pains in his hand. Brandon was 11 when Dorian went missing, Their older brother, Terrence, was 12. Brandon remembers everything like it was yesterday. But time has a funny way of playing tricks. In fact, throughout the production of this podcast, we have encountered several discrepancies and varying timelines. The fact of the matter is, it's been decades since Dorian's disappearance, and time has a way of altering memories. Over time, memories change with each retelling. Moments that seem burned into a person's brain might not be as reliable as we think. Many of the people interviewed for this podcast were children when these events took place. The stories are being told as they are remembered. We will make note of any inconsistencies throughout the series. It was Brandon's first year of middle school. Dorian was still in elementary. They rode the same bus to school but rode different buses home. So Brandon got home later than Dorian. Their mom had gotten paid that day and gave them their allowances. She gives me and my older brother $20 a piece. And because my little brother was a little, he was still a little irresponsible with money, she would only give him $10. Because Dorian got home before his brothers, he got his allowance first. He got on his bike and rode to Toot and Totem, a local convenience store chain in Amarillo with locations all over town. Most cities have a McDonald's on every corner. We have Tootin' Totems. Dorian went there to buy a can of corn and his favorite snack, a pack of Mrs. Baird's cinnamon rolls. Him and his friend, they left to go to the store together. And as they were leaving, he told his friend, hey, I'm finna go fishing. And his friend was like, nah, I don't, I'm not going. He was like, all right. And so my friend went back home. According to Brandon, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. As far as Brandon knew, Dorian was on his bike, heading toward his godmother's house, where he kept his fishing poles. Brandon made it home from school and started his normal after-school routine. He made a sandwich, took a nap, and then played video games. About six o'clock was the first time my mom asked me had I seen him, and that's when it had came to my attention that, no, I hadn't seen him since I got off the bus. But also, I'm caught up in Super Mario, so... It was like, yeah, he'll be here sooner or later. Once it had gotten dark, Brandon's mom came in again to ask him if he had seen Dorian. He told her that he hadn't seen him, and she decided that it was time to call the police. She calls the police. 
The dispatch tells her she needs to wait 24 hours before she can officially report him missing. So on a Wednesday, she calls him again. And this is like I spent that night, you know, I woke up the next day, went to school. He still hadn't made it home. This wasn't the first time Dorian had done something like this. In fact, Brandon mentioned an incident where Dorian stayed out on a school night with a friend from class. But that time, Dorian actually made it to school the next day. Brandon said that Dorian got in trouble for staying out all night without permission, but wondered if he was doing it again. And so when I got out of school and I came home, my mom, by this time, she was like in a panic. She's crying. She's like scared, nervous. She's on the phone with the police like, hey, you know, it's been 24 hours. And so they finally dispatched the cops out there. And it was crazy because I remember the first thing the cops asked her was, why did she wait so long? There have been some discrepancies about if the operator told the family to wait 24 hours. Unfortunately, we do not have access to the call because this is an ongoing investigation. Also, one of the rumors in the community at the time was that the Thomas family waited 24 hours to call the police because they didn't notice that Dorian had gone missing. My name is Sergeant Bryn Harlan. I'm with the police department here in Amarillo, currently assigned to our homicide division. In 1998, Brent Harlan was a field officer for the Amarillo Police Department. In his 30-year career, he's done a little bit of everything. He's had various assignments. In addition to being a field officer, he also had a stint on Midnight Patrol and was the Crime Stoppers coordinator. He was promoted to sergeant not only for narcotics and SWAT, but also the PACE unit which focuses on street crimes. Sergeant Harlan said that he's done literally everything on the police force, and he joked that he had done everything but get on a motorcycle, and they weren't about to get him on one of those. After the family had waited 24 hours to call again to report Dorian missing, officers Harlan and Merriman were called out. They were riding in a two-man unit, like always, because North Heights was considered a high crime area. And uh, we got dispatched to 1342 Northwest 9th on a missing person. And we get there and realize that it was Dorian, nine years old, and he had been missing for 24 hours. So we were behind the curve already. We were told that they thought that they had to wait 24 hours. And that's that's not true. You 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 see that on TV, but that's not true. Unless there's circumstances, you know, they left or something like that. If there's foul play suspected or something out of the norm, you can make a missing person report at any time. Amber Hagerman was also nine years old when she went missing from Arlington, Texas on January 13th, 1996. She was abducted and her body was found four days later. This tragedy inspired a woman from Dallas, Texas, to create a network consisting of real-time information in a pre-digital age. She asked for help from local radio stations and police agencies. Her idea was to have the information broadcast immediately through the emergency alert system when the report of a child abduction was made. The Federal Communications Commission officially endorsed the system by February 2002, The federal government also passed a bill that provided $25 million in grant funds to establish the Amber Alert program and purchase electronic highway signs. Although Amber's case is still unsolved, over 700 children have been recovered. Even though Amber was abducted and murdered just two years before Dorian went missing, Amarillo, as well as the rest of the nation, didn't have the Amber Alert system in place at that time. I don't know the statistics, but if they're not found within the first 24 hours, I don't, it's more times than not, then they're, they're not found alive. And, you know, you have the rare occasion of someone that is uh, 
what was it, the Elizabeth Smart, where she's held captive for years and finally gets out. And, you know, it's, it's things like this that generate, that generate people coming forward, you know, and we're getting to the time now, unfortunately, where people that may have information or something may pass away. Cause I mean, if they were 50 years old, then there'd be almost 74 now. And I mean, not that that's old by any means, but you know, it's just, it's just, time and sometimes people think well the police probably already know that and again it's one of those deals where if we can generate something somebody knows something you know and that's that's the deal at least one person at least one person and have we have we spoken to that one person or has that person never been on our radar at all? That's the that's the million dollar question. And they've re-interviewed people that they've spoken to over the years, and the stories haven't changed. Um, we went to I personally went to Clarendon and Memphis, where other family members were, and checked homes and met with people, and it was just it was just so frustrating, and still is today. It's one of those things, had it been 30 minutes, would it have made a difference? I, what if, you know, but maybe we would have had more people that had seen something. We had vehicle descriptions of people that, you know, were they didn't know in the area. I mean, again, high traffic area. And if somebody had seen something and, you know, they were up there for illicit activities, they don't want to come forward to the police and tell them what they're, you know, they don't want to bring the spotlight on themselves. But at that point, I'm not I'm not worried about what's going else is going on. And you know, a lot of our interviews on stuff have if there's drugs or something that are related, I'm not the drug police. I don't care about that portion of it. I want to know why this happened the way it did, whether it's a shooting or whatever. And that's that's we have our priorities. When Harlan and Merriman arrived at Dorian's house, they started their checklist of protocols. When we first get to the house, the first thing you do is search the home just to make sure the kid's not hiding or sleep or something like that. Also, you're kind of looking for signs of, you know, foul play, something like that. Went through the house. Everything was fine. Um, hadn't Didn't check him or didn't locate him, checked everywhere. And uh, we started making notification to our supervisors, and we started getting a lot of people over there to start, to start checking the area. We questioned him immediately there, you know, to try to find out, find out when the last time he was seen. And from all accounts, it was between 5.30 and 6 p.m. the previous day. So, I mean, it was literally 24 hours before before we were notified. And the information we got, he was last seen on a, on a bicycle headed to the Toot and Totem there at Boulevard Hughes. According to Brandon, the Tootin' Totem Dorian went to the day of his disappearance was just a stone's throw away from their apartment. He said you could see the store from their balcony. They have the, APD has the camera footage of him buying those two items. And they showed me the tape and that's how I knew where he was going. Like, hey, he bought corn. He's going to the lake. He went to my godmother's house. And so they take me, we go to my godmother's house. And as soon as we pull up, they knocked on the door. I just went in because, I, you know, I can do that. And so they're standing there explaining to her what's going on. I done already ran back there in our room. And I remember the last time we went fishing, she came and picked us up from the lake. We went to her house, and he put his fishing poles in her closet. And so when I looked in that closet and I seen those fishing poles in there, that's when I knew something wasn't right. I told the police something ain't right. He didn't make it over here. He had reportedly stayed at a house sometimes up on, on North Wilson. So that was the first place we went. And uh, I guess it was not uncommon for him to stay either at home or there. And so we went up there, checked that house. The last time they had seen him, I believe that was on a Sunday because I think he went missing on Monday and we were found out on Tuesday, if, if memory serves me correctly. So we started going to friends' house, people he had was known to hang out with, kids he played with, and everybody always said that he was going to a friend's house or was going to the store. I did see some still footage or still photographs of from Toot and Totem, but 
what I could tell, I couldn't tell what it was. I, I truly couldn't. Um, there were some kids that were in the Teuton Totem, but it didn't match the clothing description that Doreen was last seen in, according to family members. So I don't know if they were ever able to determine that, yes, that was him or no, it wasn't. Again, you know, the case has been archived, and I don't have access to the actual hard copies of the file because they keep everything in there. I was just going through everything that had been scanned into our computer system. Our request to see the footage from Tutan Totem was denied because this is an ongoing investigation. Also, we should clear up the confusion about the timeline. Brandon mentioned his mom waited to call the police the second time on Wednesday, meaning that Dorian would have went missing on a Tuesday. Harlan reported that Dorian went missing on Monday and the police started their search on Tuesday. According to articles from the Amarillo Daily News, Dorian went missing on Monday and was reported missing on Tuesday. On Sunday night, the night before he disappeared, Dorian had gone to church. He had been picked up by Anna Lane of City Church, a local church that sponsored the Thomas family, helping them with food and gifts during the holidays. Once everyone realized Dorian was nowhere to be found, the real work began. We pulled everybody that we could possibly have. Um, I'm 99.9% .9 sure we pulled in detectives that night, called them in. Um, they had set up a command post. We started canvassing the area. We started knocking on doors. Um, we actually contacted AISD. He was a student for AISD and contacted the principal at the school he was at found out who his friends were at school and started notifying them, got a good photograph of him, put out um, pictures. Of course, this was on the news, so this was prior to Nixle and everything else where you could get a bunch of people very quickly notified. And we just tried to notify as many people as we possibly could. Nixle is a notification system used by the Amarillo Police Department. Nixle enables real-time, two-way communication through text, email, voice messages, social media, and the Nixle mobile app. Nixle is now used by over 8,000 agencies, including fire and police departments, schools, and hospitals. The news, the media, I mean, that was our best thing, you know. That's when I noticed, you know, like the community actually rallying together behind one cause. And, you know, it was kind of overwhelming for me because I've never been involved in anything like this. Like, I'm out here draining lakes, helping train search dogs. Like, it was hectic around that time. When a child is abducted, every second counts. As the hours turned into days, APD and Dorian's family searched the area exhaustively. Our city is broken up into what we call beats you know, geographic areas that, that, that officers are responsible for, and they had taken a beat map and marked through all the areas they had covered. It was door-to-door, -door, everything. Um, our motors units were out checking alleys. I mean, you know, you, it sounds morbid, but we check dumpsters. You check everything because you, you don't know. You don't have a scene, for lack of a better term. And it just became very, very manpower intensive, very time intensive. There was horseback searches, ATV searches, helicopter searches, dog searches. I mean, it was it was a very, very long process. Every, I mean, every area north of the railroad tracks were checked. Thompson Park Lake was checked. I know um, Martin Road Park um, there at 16th and Martin Road was checked. And then there was uh, a small body of water over at Gene Howe Park, which is directly across the street from Martin Road. And all of those were checked. The dive team actually went into Martin Road Lake, checked kids in Arizona, California, up into Washington, up in the Northeast, Dallas, Denver. I mean, we got so many tips and just none of them, none of them panned out. Over the next few weeks, the search for Dorian intensified. Sergeant Harlan said APD search within the boundary of their beat, starting at Amarillo Boulevard to north of the city limits. They even searched the Canadian River, which is almost 20 miles from Dorian's apartment. APD also received a number of tips regarding Dorian's case. We'd gotten some information that uh, he was at a location on the other side of uh, uh, Tootin' Totem, called the, uh, the, we called it the kitchen, and that he had met a guy there It was a family member and may have possibly gone to Dallas. So that lead was followed up on. That family member was, was uh, interviewed, nothing. They did polygraphs on 
a large number of people. Um, they, again, sounds morbid, but contacted all of our known sex offenders. They were interviewed, and those people um, knew that the police were coming and were prepared, and they photographed and everything like that. But again, nothing. We asked Sergeant Harlan if the FBI ever investigated Dorian's case. There were some FBI investigators that came here, and um, they had done some of the work with the special crimes detectives. Um, I do not know what their true role is. Their reports would not be in our reports because of the, the difference between federal law and state law. We wouldn't have access to their reports. Even though DNA was still in its early stages in 1998, police departments were collecting samples from crime scenes. We asked Sergeant Harlan if the APD acquired DNA from Dorian's belongings. They did DNA on stuff that they knew he had touched, and then they did the familial or parental DNA, taking DNA from the father and the mother, and then they can get a, uh, a profile from that. But that, that was taken then. We have the CSI effect now where everybody thinks that, you know, you're going to have fingerprints and DNA and video and everything on every case. And sometimes that's just not true. And then sometimes you are inundated with, with uh, forensic evidence. But that DNA was entered into what we call TCIC, which is the Texas Crime Information Center, and NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center. So all that stuff goes in there. And it has a set number, and it will stay in there forever. The geographic landscape of the Texas Panhandle also created challenges. While the land looks incredibly flat, it is usually covered with mesquite trees, which makes search efforts challenging. Not only is the prairie full of unpredictable terrain, the wildlife can also prove difficult to maneuver. Prairie dogs create huge holes in the ground that can injure horses, Insects of all varieties are at the ready to sting unsuspecting victims. And of course, there are rattlesnakes, which obviously don't need an explanation as to why they're problematic. So when the APD was searching by land, there was an incredible amount of challenges they faced. Along with those challenges included the unpredictable Texas Panhandle weather. A constant joke in Amarillo is that the only thing that separates Amarillo from Canada is, quote, nothing but a barbed wire fence. End quote. This area gets around 18 inches of snow per year, a shocking number to out-of-towners who ask, don't you live in Texas? The week Dorian went missing was a particularly wet week for this area. The weather here goes between hot and dry, bitterly cold and snowy, to overly rainy. After months of practically being a desert, any amount of rain will cause low-lying areas to fill up with water. Playa lakes, as we call them, are dry lake beds that fill up with water when it finally rains after months of drought, causing many areas to flood. The search for Dorian had to be called off within the first few days due to the extreme rain that week. If there was any evidence, it had been washed away. Search dogs would have a harder time picking up his scent. With all of these factors, it's honestly no surprise that searching for Dorian was unsuccessful. The other part of the search included the North Heights area itself. North Heights is located on the north side of Amarillo. The area is one of the oldest sections of town and sadly, most Amarillo residents have never been there before. Here is North Heights resident, Keith Grays. I was born and raised in Amarillo, Texas in North Heights. I've never moved from there except for to attend college. Long time native Amarillo. 1957 until this present day, I've lived in North Heights, Amarillo. People who have lived here for a lifetime and have never driven that area. A lot of residents of Amarillo at the time of Dorian's disappearance had no idea what that area of town even looked like. North Heights is located near Thompson Park, the biggest park in the area, which features a small lake, Frisbee golf courses, the Amarillo Zoo, and Wonderland Park, an amusement park that's been in operation since 1951. Nearby is also Ross Rogers Golf Course, which opened in 1940. Even though the neighborhood is near the biggest family-oriented destinations in town, people choose not to take the route that takes you through North Heights. As you head up Hughes Street leaving North Heights, the landscape changes into prairie land. It eventually turns into the area that I grew up in, known as River Road. 
long stretches of pastures are separated by barbed wire fences. This area looks like a postcard of Texas. Cattle, horses, barns, and windmills scatter across the horizon. The horizon that goes on for what feels like forever. I've seen some of the best sunsets in my life while living out there. I had a friend once who moved here from New York. She said the vast openness made her feel uncomfortable. She wasn't a fan of, quote, being able to see everything at once. I joked with her that it was actually easier to see what's coming for you. The terrain in the area, while easier to see from overhead, is extremely spread out. Dorian could have gone anywhere. He could have been miles away, especially on his bicycle. But also, it makes it easier for someone to take off with him. They could go any number of directions with lots of places to hide. Highways that could take them out of state within a couple of hours. Amarillo is only an hour and a half from the New Mexico border and only two hours to the Oklahoma border. Interstates 40 and 27 are only a few miles from North Heights, giving someone easy access to head out of town in a hurry. For 24 hours, I can be in Northern California. I can be in the Northeast. I mean, you can be in Canada. You can be anywhere in 24 hours from where we're at. You can be in El Paso doing the speed limit in seven and a half hours to eight hours, you know, and then you're crossing. And I'm not saying that that's a possibility. I'm just saying that just where we are geographically located, we're almost smack dab in the middle of the United States. As far as the middle, we're not exactly in the middle north and south, but we're not far. Texas is a huge state. And, you know, it's just you hear stories of, you know, past people, kids that have been abducted and found in other states very quickly. But the biggest challenge in the search for Dorian was the complete lack of evidence. There were no traces of him or his bike. He had just vanished. 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 And personally, I think the lack of information is the reason why people are frustrated with this case. If there is a video from Toot and Totem that day, why hasn't it been released? If there is a 911 call, why can't we hear it? It's been decades, so why can't the public be let in on the case? Somebody wanted him out of the way, not because he was a young black male, but because he had information. Dorian was one of the kids who found Gloria behind the YMCA. I didn't know this until today. Thank you. Thank you. The fact is, a year before Dorian went missing, he and his friends found the body of a woman. A woman who had been stabbed to death. A case that is also still unsolved. Next time on what happened to Dorian Thomas. A lot of people seem to knew that he was one of the kids that found the body back there, but nobody has the name on the other two people. Whoever did it, they, they horrible, but they're gonna pay. Apparently, there was supposed to be two bodies back there. With Gloria? What Happened to Dorian Thomas is a Macabre Club production. Written and produced by me, Amy Hart. Co-produced by Madison Fowler. Sound design by Juan Duran. If you have any information about the disappearance of Dorian Thomas or the murders of Gloria Covington or Linda Jackson, please contact the Amarillo Police Department's Cold Case Unit at 806-378-9446. Please help us share Dorian, Gloria, and Linda's stories. You can help by rating, reviewing, and sharing our podcast. 
Plus, if you'd like to help support us, please join us on Patreon. You can get early access to new episodes, a private community to discuss the cases, and live Q&As with the creators. Please click the link in our bio for more information. Thank you for listening.